Welcome. Uh, I'm Ryan, Reinhold Martin, the director of the Beale Center, for those of you who have not yet uh, had a chance to participate in the dialogues that we have collaborated with, uh, uh, with Enrique this summer. Um, and here, I'm only here basically to get out of the way uh, and offer the platform to our two very distinguished uh, colleagues um, who have been conducting this conversation now uh, for seven years. Um, and, uh, and in each case, around a different theme. Um, so uh, I, I w uh, first want to uh, <laughs> sort of paradoxically welcome Dean Mark Wigley to his own stage. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 He's usually, you know, doing that. Uh, and I think also uh, want to uh, remind those of you new to the school that I'm sure you know that you have an opportunity to, to learn from Mark in the, in the wonderful lecture course that he does, um, I guess coming up in the fall again. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, Peter Eisenman, uh, architect, educator, theorist uh, of Yale University, um, whose uh, interventions, provocations, and contributions you surely also know. So um, the, uh, the theme, uh, agreed upon today is, is simply the word design. Uh, we'll see where that goes and you know, I'll yeah. uh, ask, the, the rules of the game, I should say the format is, is uh, strictly sort of controlled, one hour of give and take uh, and then one hour of questions from you, so prepare your questions. Okay, thank you again and welcome uh, both. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, 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 sorry. I, and I have to say, sorry, sorry, I can say it. Happy birthday to Peter. Thank you. Uh, and and, and um, <laughs> it is his birthday. Uh, I, he ruined my opening line. Ah. Uh, uh, first of all, um, thank you. Uh, Mark and I have a bet uh, that uh, we had agreed when we started to do uh, ten, 10 of these uh, to correspond to his deanship. And Mark said he didn't know if he'd be able to finish uh, because he wasn't sure that he wanted to be dean for 10 years. And I said, no, 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 you have to do this. So our bet is that he, he uh, says, I doubt we'll get to 10. I said, well, I'll bet we go over 10, uh, kind of over under around 10. So if he, we do it for 10 years, nobody wins. We do it for nine, uh, you win. If we do it for eleven, I win. Right? It's a big meal. Uh, uh, is that correct? Four seasons. Yeah, four seasons for Patriot, four. Patriot, Cynthia, you. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. For four. Uh, but, but the rule is, if it's uh, ten, no, nobody wins. I win. <laughs> <laughs> I a, win because because uh, I only lose if if I go longer than ten. No, but you could cancel the eleventh. Uh, talk. It's true. It's true. <laughs> we, we have to, we'll discuss it over lunch. Anyway, that was not my, uh, I, I wanted to say something much more avuncular and sentimental uh, to introduce, which is not usually my role. Uh, but I have to say that in addition to it being my birthday, and therefore I'm in a rather sort of funny mood, uh, I don't like birthdays, <laughs> but what is even funnier is that uh, this Friday uh, marks the 50th anniversary of the last exam that I took at Columbia University um, <laughs> in uh, summer school. I was trying to qualify for my Fulbright scholarship, which I had won, and so I needed a second language. and. Um, uh, I had to take French because I was going to France um, and uh, I took an eight week, eight hour a day immersion course in French and so Friday is the key day and 50 years ago I was where you all are. So uh, it's uh, a very strange anniversary. Uh, how dumb I was. Uh, just so that you will know not how dumb am I, 
but how I dumb I was, was in my years at Columbia, um, I never knew Rudolf Bitcover nor studied with him. And I took quite a number of courses in Skirmahorn, and uh, I was innocent of Rudolf Bitcover, uh, which tells you that there's much, much hope for all of you who think <laughs> that you know something when you really know very little. Uh, in fact, um, uh, I was going to France uh, on a mission from Professor Robert Branner of the Art History Department, who is a famous Gothicist. Um, who I was one of his pet students, and I was going to study the uh, Fourth Nave Bay at Soissons Cathedral to find out how, why it was different than all the other bays in Soissons, if you could believe it. That was my Fulbright grant. And of course, what happened to me, which is uh, apocryphal, is I went over on the SS Flandre. I spoke French the whole way over. I saw the movie Plein de Soleil, on the, which was with Alain Delon, uh, the first in French. Um, and I was really into it. And I took the uh, boat, uh, boat train from Le Havre to the Gare du Nord. I got out of the Gare du Nord. I got into a taxi. And I even remember the instructions. I said, uh, je, veux, je voudrais la le, le rue Gilles Lacour, s'il vous plaît. And the taxi driver looked at me, turned around and looked at me, said, hey, buddy, it's better if you speak English. <laughs> And I thought, uh, that's it, because I had a, also, at the same time, I had a, a Kinney grant to go to England. Um, and I had decided to go to France. And I got back on the next train and uh, went to Cambridge. And that's the, mm -hmm. how you and I happen to be mm -hmm. here today. Anyway. Um, do you want me to say anything else as a way of the well, beginning? I no, mean, I mean the the the, um, the way this works is normally Peter is the sort of lead-off hitter, mm -hmm. and he fills the room with wisdom. Um, I'm feeling unwise, and uh, then we discuss how how wise he has been, um, and it seems to me that we, in the end, always what we're trying to talk about is what's cooking, right? Not just for us, but in, in the field. So this 50-year thing seems to me looms, you know, so it could be sort of like, um, given what happened in the last 50 years, what might be happening now. But the theme, the actual word we're going to concentrate on, so it's we'll probably design. look at what this word design might have meant and what it might mean in the future. We're going to concentrate yeah. on design. So it's going to start with a question from me to you, right, which is, uh, architecture and design, what's the relationship? Yeah. Well, I, I, w I want to say, just to preface before I answer that question, um, what we are both asking in discussing this is, has design gone anywhere in 50 years? In other words, could it have been predicted where it was and where it is today? Uh, and um, we can argue that, uh, uh, I, I would say this, that um, certainly, as um, Reinhold was saying earlier, you know, European design was um, uh, in an ascendancy in the late 50s and early 60s. I was looking at a book of uh, an Italian architect, Caccia Domignoni, who is a very obscure Italian architect, I should tell you, not in preparation mm -hmm. for this, but just yesterday we were, because we're doing an apartment block in Milan and we're trying to understand the uh, typology of um, uh, apartment blocks. And Caccia Domignoni was one of the favorite uh, neo-liberty, you know, post-war guys who was doing upper middle class Milanese apartments. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that design 
has its ascendancy and 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 so you look at what Caccia Domagnoni was doing I mean he was doing furniture post-war furniture he was doing lamps he was doing knives forks and spoons I mean he was designing everything mm -hmm. for the a rising haute bourgeoisie of uh, nor you know recovering northern Italy you know where uh, the residue of the auto industry from Torino was you know, uh, turning Milan into a fashion capital and a design world. Uh, Domus, uh, under Joe Ponte, was, had always been interested in, in design, but seemed to uh, be in an, in an ascendancy. Uh, uh, Casabella, which uh, re retained its name, uh, you know, uh, beautiful house, or, uh, under Rogers in the 50s and 60s. So. I would argue that the capital of the world of design, if we just want to place the world, certainly was uh, northern Italy and certainly Milano. It certainly wasn't Paris or London. Uh, in the, I mean, London doesn't come into the scene. Uh, you know, it, it had um, this is tomorrow exhibition and things, but. Basically, design, you know, London was still, you couldn't eat a good meal in England. Women still were, you know, with those strange hairdos. Uh, uh, Soho was in a certain kind of ascendancy. But Milan, the difference between Milan and London that I experienced was quite something. And what you realize is even the minor architects were into design, all right? And of course, what I would argue is that design is that manifestation of the ascendancy of global capital, is the mark of that ascendancy. Uh, I wasn't saying good or bad, but that every, you know, you had to go and uh, have things designed. When I was working at the Architects Collaborative for Gropius in Cambridge, they owned a shop called Design Research, which was right next door, which Ben Thompson, who became dean at Harvard, um, uh, ran. And Swiss, uh, uh, Swedish design, Mari Mako, was the rage, you know, and, and uh, cool, aesthetic, you know, slimmed down, uh, simple aesthetics, as opposed to the Milanese, which was m far more uh, Baroque in, in its mm -hmm. in its attitude. So, uh, but 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 uh, Marimeko and 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 Dr was what it was. Mm -hmm. You know, everything in your house had to be Dr. Uh, you know, white dishes, white plates, white. Egg, you know. Yeah. You know. Um, and so the re the question is, uh, there was the same culture of design that we have in a, in a certain way, maybe less available to target the market of the target stores. But I think what is really interesting and why I'm interested in the subject is, um, first of all, Harvard has several times changed the name of its school. It's no longer the GSD, but it is one of the few schools that goes by the name of Design School. Mm -hmm. And it changed that, I believe, in the 40s. I, I believe that's when the, the GSD changed its mm -hmm. name. Um, and the provocation for me to be interested in this subject today is that Cornell, after being one of the, I think, the second or third oldest architecture schools, is deciding to change their name from College of Architecture to College of Design to as it sense, operate more efficiently in a more comprehensive idea of design uh, as, uh, you know, systems analysis, uh, environmental analysis, et cetera, going into other uh, areas uh, other than architecture as a major focus. And of course, one argues is that the, the ascendancy of design as an idea, as an overriding idea, um, as opposed to, uh, I think, architecture, which stands for something else. Mm -hmm. And 
I think that if the name, if, if, if words are important, then architecture has always been other than, in, in addition to design, uh, something other. Other, and other than or in addition to? Which other than, which, other which than. One is it? Which one do you want? Uh, I'll t take them both for, to start with. All right. All right, we can look at both of them. Um, I would argue that design, ultimately, what do we mean by design? Well, certainly better function uh, in, in one, one sense. In other words, uh, uh, um, that is an overall uh, strategic view mm -hmm. of the world, mm -hmm. uh, a process. Uh, and uh, it's tactics, I would argue, the, the tactics of design, if design is a strategic uh, discourse, let's say, uh, would be aesthetics. The major tactic would be certainly I even to the sacrificing of function. I mean, if you look at any of the things that Domignon, Caccia Domignoni was doing in terms of, of knives, forks, and spoons, you'd say, oh, God, you know, can you get food onto those things? Uh, and the lamps and the chairs that he was making, you'd say, you know, and still we can go back as early as the Bauhaus and say, you know, the aestheticization, that is the modern aesthetic, uh, was always the component, I think, first before function, let's say. Uh, I think that uh, Mises' chairs, Korb's chairs, Rietveld's chairs, sacrificed comfort, let's say, or function for an, aest an aesthetic value, let's say, given to the product. Uh, um, and, uh, I mean, I sit on Tone chairs. We have them all over our house mm. from the first decade of the century. They ain't comfortable, uh, but they look nice. Uh, you know, the bent wood has a certain quality. Uh, the, the cane, the caning has a certain quality, etc. So I would argue that design's <laughs> ultimate goal in, in the 20th century was had something to do with an aesthetic of the modern, right? Uh, and I would say that architecture, if I to go back to its uh, its particular autonomy, uh, is a is a formal one, not an aesthetic one. And I and I think that for me is a, a, an enormous difference. That is an internal logic and consistency that subsumes design or aesthetic, not design, let's say, but the aesthetic within its internal logic. So the, so the punchline is that if a school, of, a school of architecture changes its name to a school of design, design, from your point of view, it's a retrograde act <coughs> on the one hand because it's, it's a it's a return to kind of Bauhaus use of the word design? I would, I would argue not only a return to that, but it's, it's a return to uh, the aestheticization of, of product, let's say. And you, you are an architect, not a designer, presumably. I would argue that I've never designed anything, that yeah. I live in a dumb house, a uh, dumb apartment, uh, wear dumb clothes. Uh, so this the stupidity that you had when you graduated from Columbia to be a huge asset. A, a huge asset. Uh, as an architect. But but some people would argue But that you've done plates. I have you've done white plates. Yeah, they never sold. So they they never sold them. They so couldn't they sell were, them. So they were dumb because they were the sign that they are the that they are the work of an architect is that they couldn't be sold. No, because all the other architects things sold. Michael Graves. They might have been up Michael Graves makes a living off of Target, honestly. And if you should go to Michael, I, you know, Michael, I have dear, dear friend. Uh, we're doing an oral history together. And for me, it's very sad to see his studio now turning out whatever it is for a Target market. Because according to you, that's design, not architecture. And it's design of a certain sentimental... Yeah. Uh, the lowest possible common denominator. And Gropius would be a designer, not yeah, an architect. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but now that we know that you worked for him, and that's why we I have left. every reason to be suspicious that you might be a closet designer. 
Mas masquerading as an architect. You, you could Denouncing you aesthetics in the name of something obviously superior, form. Formal. Formal, which is not aesthetic. No, it, it also is at certain times aesthetic, but its goal is not the aestheticization of product. So can it, so there can be an aesthetic argument which it could even be crucial, but that, that's not the not, whole deal. Not, not the whole deal. Um, Let's go back, by the way, yeah. I, I have to tell you honestly, I left architecture as I knew, or whatever that was, Gropius yeah. was called, uh, precisely because of that, the reasons I'm articulating today, that there was some frustration that all these guys were interested in was, let's make it look, let's make the things look good without any rationale at all. I mean, mm -hmm. we were just turning stuff out. Uh, there, were, there was no necessary internal logic to anything that we were doing. So, so Gropius, your mentor. No, no. <laughs> um, I thought I had reached the, 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 the mountain, okay? Director of the school, the Bauhaus, right. which is the very center of this concept of design right. that you're talking about. Right and director of the school at Harvard, mm -hmm. as it assumes the name design. Design. So somebody. Right. Well, so there's a symbolic. A figure you can okay. use for your. Well, you could use it too, because the fact that they changed it under Gropius to a school of design yeah. from, yeah. Uh, therefore these words must mean something. Oh, yeah, 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 I think so. Okay. But, but so look, let's say if, if Gropius is a kind of clear figure for this uh, concept of design that you don't approve of. Well, you, you know, you, you're, you're putting well, words in my mouth. When you uh, said, no, no, I'm you saying said there's a difference. I want to articulate today that I don't want to talk about approval or disapproval. But uh, nevertheless, when you mention what Cornell is going to add to its curriculum system. Not it's add, it's going, to, it's going to change but the But your name head was going like this as you said that. So it's <laughs> and this is your school too, C it Cornell, is right? My school, right. So you would be as somebody who doesn't want to be a designer, you would now be Against the alum of a design school, school as right. distinct from an architecture right, right. school. And, and, a, and, a, and a school with a proud history and tradition, right? And of architecture. Yeah, of which architecture. Is up right. versus design, which hmm. is slip well, to slippery, a, smooth, aesthetic. I would argue that when we take Colin Rowe and Ungers as two key figures yeah. who are both uh, architects in the true sense of the word for me. Right. They bo their major careers in the United States were at Cornell. I mean, that's part of the, mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, Paul Rudolph started teaching there, Gerhard Kalman started teaching there, Aldo Jurgler started teaching. I mean, it has had a history, a history of, of uh, interesting people there that who were, I consider, architects. Right. And so, but if Gropius, let's say if Gropius again is our figure of, okay. our, you know, um, Luca Rizier, architect or designer? Architect. But he was trained to decorate mm -hmm. the back of watches. Yeah. So he's trained as a designer. Mm -hmm. So what is it, he saw the light and became an architect or? Well, most of us I think are trained, I think that all of my students at Yale are being trained as designers, by the way. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, because the object of our school is to turn people into professional success, which means design, being able to design for uh, any scale environment, etc. In other words, the the issue is not being turned into to ideologues or conceptualizer or theoretical uh, people, but to perform in an environment, a professional environment. That right. is the stated goal of the school at Yale. Which is a, in every way a wonderful place, um, presumably. The, the, the no, no, I'm saying is despite what I might consider to be a mandate for a university, Yale takes that as its, as right. its mandate and I would argue that probably 95% of the schools that we know take design as a mandate. Right. Maybe calling it architecture, but it's really design. But I'm just, I'm just trying to, I think I agree with you, um, but I'm just trying to cling on to that word design. Go ahead. 
Jeff, bef let's before we have some fun with it, to right. try to understand exactly, because the implication of what you're saying is that th this word design and in the way you use it is associated with an all too seamless relationship between the work of the designer or architect and uh, the market. The market, yes. Right, so. Mm -hmm. um, Increasingly so. So that the, the you know, th the Thorne chair is, was an, just a s sort of shockingly successful, mm -hmm. uh, and you say it's not comfortable, but that doesn't mean it's not functional when the function is to be a commodity, a commodity. To, to move, right? That's so correct. presumably um, Michael's teapot may or may not work really well as a teapot in terms of function of tea, but mm -hmm. that's not the crucial. It works Correct. really, really oh well, well at symbolizing a teapot in a market at a certain price. Yeah. I would also argue that to, let's add another thing about the market. I think it is, um, patronizing to have Michael Graves design product for Target, which is aimed at the lowest common denominator. In other words, uh, people who can't afford very much, who have no taste necessarily. It's not helping them to develop a critical taste or a better eye. It's to make them feel better about the world because they can buy Mar Michael Graves product at Target. And I think that's a very patronizing uh, problem. So it's better if a city in the north of Spain uh, feels better about itself by hiring you? I, I, I don't see where that, the correlation. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> one version would say he's the good guy because he's giving, he's allowing ordinary people, people with not much it. money to feel better about themselves. That's, I, and you you're the bad guy, you're the bad guy yeah. because that's you're at the you top end of that's, the You don't think that's patronizing? particularly to dumb down work so that it meets a certain market that oh, will I buy it. it. It may be super patronizing, but so too might be your project in Galicia. I didn't ever, w w we w I never got into this discussion. Yeah, I'm just saying, you, you know. <laughs> you could. You, you could say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, You yeah. could say, no hey, question. That's, that's great. Super they, patronizing. Um, I, I, you could argue the same. People can buy self-esteem by buying the product. Yeah, but the thing is, and if you're, if my intention is if, if we were to distinguish between art and design, I would be interested in the discipline of architecture, not so much in the uh, peop making people feel good in Galicia. Okay. As you know very well. Yeah, and as you know, why I respect you a lot is you screw it up so often. In other words, you would still do the project that gave you intellectual satisfaction right. even though you would lose the client. That's In other words, you would- Which I have on, on many occasions. A volumetric scale. Right. So- I mean, it's an amazing thing that the project is still moving in Galicia. But if, if what we're saying is true, then the architecture we admire doesn't so easily flow through the market. It does not. Now, I would think that history, by the way, Whereas according history to you, would design, design well, yeah. does. I right? would argue that history, the history that we know, has rarely, f I mean, uh, with exceptions, has rarely flo uh, flowed through the market. Okay. So, I mean, the most successful practitioners are not the practitioners we necessarily study in uh, our history courses, theory courses, et cetera. Right, so, so in a certain sense that, that in, this, in this particular way of understanding the word design, let's take the, is, is a kind of efficiency. Let's, let's take our famous friend, uh, and what do we do with him? Because that is really, we should sit here and put him on the table because He's the most powerful architect since Bernini. We would all agree to that. But and he also, to, most to his credit as to yours, screws it up many times. <laughs> not as many it's not times. A smooth, it's not a smooth. <coughs> no, but now, is he, will history remember him as an architect or a designer? But you have to answer the question because this is your I use of the word design. We didn't get to me yet. 
Oh, I, I, I thought we, you, you were going along with it. I'm just, no, I said to you quite clearly, I just want to get a oh. sense All of right. what your concept of design is. Well, let's take Philip See? Johnson. Oh, yeah. Let's, let's put him on the table and then you can uh, come back because I don't want to, my, I, I would argue Philip that. Philip in your theory has to be a designer. Right. And Philip's. Um, for the most, for, you know, we're, we're, we're saying there, there are exceptions. Philip's time at Harvard would be consistent with that and his <laughs> um, being totally unimpressed by Gropius would not be significant for you because he was nevertheless part right. of I would argue uh, it goes a new product. It goes so far, and I don't want to move Reinhold out of his comfort zone. Uh, but Reinhold has a line in this book which says that uh, the corners of Johnson's uh, pentoil are aesthetic, and without saying whether they should be aesthetic or not. Mm. In other words, that Johnson ultimately he doesn't say this, but I'm I'm saying was an aestheticizer. And I think corners are not aesthetic. I think corners are both formal, uh, part of the formal autonomy of architecture. They have been what makes architecture different than design over history. The corners in Santa Maria della Pace, the corners at Urbino, the, the corners at any number of places where they are con consciously articulated uh, as such are part of the autonomy of architecture. And so therefore, to aestheticize the corner, to me, is to move out of architecture into design. Okay, but, uh, but so it seems I to wasn't, me- I wasn't making a critique of, I agree with you about Johnson aestheticizing right, the corner. Right, but it, so far, every, everything that we've said sustains an image of design as being, as having a sort of a smooth relationship to the market, client. to the, whether, the cli whether, the, whether, the, whether the market be understood as the client or as or function or as global distribution or as success whatever. for the architecture. Right. So there's a kind of a sense of smoothness and efficiency to it. Right? Mm. Well, that's efficiency. You said efficiency. But it, mm. for there's nobody more efficient than Philip Johnson. <laughs> okay. That's Mr. Right. Efficiency. I, I want to be careful that the, the corners that you're, dev you're playing for me are, are, are not too tight that I can't get out. Okay. <laughs> Because you, you're saying that you're, no, no, you no, haven't no. put your, no, I'm, just uh, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the adjectival um, movement, and yeah. I, I, don't, I don't see it as neutral. All right. I see it but as, as enclosing. No, but the designer, the des yeah, the yeah. designer is becomes somebody that one would, would th not think highly of because things are moving too directly and too easily. Yeah. Wait a minute. I, I want to change, I, I want to say, we have agreed that architecture and design are two different discourses, right? No. Oh, I thought we did. No, no, no. You oh, I thought, you I said thought we went in You said, and I quote, um, <laughs> the, big issue, the big question was, I interrupt you in the middle, is it architecture and design or architecture and or design? And I said design? we're going to play it both. So what we don't know yet is whether architecture is like something else, baby, or whether it's both. Design and architecture are in some kind of relationship that's that we want to talk about. Where that's what we do want to talk about because right. they've gotten confused. Right. People think they're doing architecture when they're really doing design, and the schools have never recently said, let's sort this thing out. Uh, and what we ought to try and do is, if we agree that it's both, what then, and this is where I'm asking you, how would you define, if there's a need to have D and A, what, what is the N, uh, D and A? Oh, well, I'm not so, f uh, for what it's worth, I don't think I'm necessarily so far, far away from what you're doing. No, I don't it, think you are either. It's, for me, the issue is always the same, right? Why the hell did I become an architect? You know, what went wrong? Why, why did that happen? Yeah, of course, people could uh, argue that both of us sitting here are not architects. Right, so, but the nebulous you, you, So you, we gotta be careful. You find yourself glued to architecture. So there's always this right. question, well, what the hell is architecture? Mm -hmm. Now, if you develop a concept called design that may not be the real deal, mm -hmm. may not be what it is that drew you to architecture, thinking about design can help you think, what the hell is this architecture thing that interests me? There right? you go. So 
if, if design is associated with this kind of efficiency and this kind of smoothness, this kind of lack of trauma, just to yeah. exaggerate my okay. and give away my point, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Then architecture, w what attracts it might be to do with the lack of smoothness, the lack of the fluidity, the sort of interruption, the delay, the contradiction, the hesitation. Things are not clear. Things are not, you know, if there was anything. And why would anybody want that? That's the real question. Why do these two people want that? Why do we, yeah. yeah. In other words, I, I constantly ask myself, why, if that's the case, and I agree with you that it, in most cases it is, why would anybody want architecture by itself without design? Uh, why not, you know, try and get both? Uh, because well, well, one theory that would come out of this is there's no evidence that they do. There's no evidence that anybody really ever wants architects. In fact, if no, they, they, no, if they no think that architects are designers, right. they're really just being confused. Right, correct. Right. So I mean, I if, if there's no evidence that anybody wants the design uh, architecture, they really want design, and they can call it what they want because they don't know the difference. But the interesting thing is, they do know the difference because my clients or the people that I work with know the difference between me and Frank Gehry, me and Richard Meyer. Not saying good or bad, they do know the difference, and they don't want what they consider to be the problems or the problematic associated with what I do as opposed to yeah, what they which, do. Which would translate in terms so of this discussion is they don't want architecture. They don't want architecture. To which a reasonable person in the audience might say, ah, yeah. Yeah. so when somebody doesn't want you, what they don't want is architecture. It's not that they don't want yeah. you. Yeah, right? I'm increasingly... So it's a sort of... But, but I'm increasingly aware. Let me just make it very clear uh, that I'm producing students at Yale, graduates, and especially the yeah. students that collect around the, the work that I'm doing at Yale, let's say, yeah. are, are totally unfit in a, in a real sense to move into society as they understand architecture. In other words, uh, that I'm producing uh, mis misfits. And I am more increasingly aware of that. That so uh, if, if only they could be as misfitted as you were when you left this place, <laughs> they've got a chance. Well, I knew enough to, I had a commission. I didn't tell you that part of the story. I had a big commission at Cornell. Uh, the, the thing came in at 100% uh, over the budget. Um, <laughs> In fact, Mike McKinnell and John Fowler and I worked on it together. John Fowler went to work, you know, you know yeah. who they are. And it was a, a, a brutalist uh, project, yeah. you know, probably would have been the first brutalist project in the United States. And uh, when it came in over 100%, I said, screw it, I'm out of here, and left. Walked away and went to England. Uh, so that's a, the other side of the story, that I was not willing to make the changes necessary to produce this project. So you, you are the very figure then, a kind of poster child for um, a concept of architecture, which is sort of architecture as a sort of misfit in the market. In the market. Right. That, that, which, that which makes the project attractive to you, that which makes it architecture, is that which makes it difficult for it to move in the market. And colleagues of yours, friends of yours, don't have the same problem. May I, may I ask, isn't that true of Michael Haneke, the filmmaker? Isn't it true of, of uh, people who write uh, great literature? Uh, the, the, the market isn't set up to take any of them. I mean, I mean, t we were talking about Wagner before. Wagner was a total misfit. Yeah, but the, the question here is whether, whether, whether. I mean, I agree. But the question here is whether your own absurd pathology. No, I think culture. Right, I would argue is a good model. It's not, is no, a good, it's a no, fabulous model. Is a good model for. I'll tell you why. Because culture must survive the marketplace. And uh, that's why Michael Haneke makes the films he makes. That's why Wagner designed four-hour and five-hour operas. 
Uh, they were, Rienzi was an eight-hour opera to begin with. They could never play it because nobody wanted to sit for eight hours, so they had to cut it to four. Uh, so I, I'm saying is that culture, the survival of culture, architecture is part of that survival. It's not the books you see in the airport uh, newsstands. It's not what you see in your local film houses. Uh, so the survival of culture depends upon you. Not me. Well, the the discourses that I'm. All talking right. No, about. but that's the thing. I want to. Uh, you could take you, right? Yeah. And your pathology. I don't call it a pathology. It's a. <laughs> well, that's kind of pathological <laughs> of you. Um, yeah. And and say, what if it's like that for every? What if that's a good <coughs> model for the general relationship of architecture and society? And you're just an extreme case. I, I which is why you obsess all the time about the discipline of architecture yeah, and right. saving the discipline. You, you yeah. talk about the discipline of architecture like other people talk about trees and uh, yeah. polar bears yeah, that's right. and that's right. oysters that's in the Mississippi. Right. Right? That's it, no it's question. That's precious really little thing that's under threat and you're yeah. the only one not only tied to it. No, no, I'm not you, How many other people are with you, like two? Well, you are. Well, that's two, uh, right? I mean, Beatrice, uh, three, you know, Enrique, you know. Reinhold, okay, so I mean, I can, that's why they're here. So there's a little gang of people who think that something that culture doesn't want. No, 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 that, that well is culture, is, no, that is the market doesn't want. What Let's the market doesn't not want fuse the words. is what culture needs. No, what culture has been and seems to right, be. Right, and, survi and it's survival. survival. So the okay. survival of culture. It survives despite the market. Culture will survive. I've by the work of a, f of a few people who won't deliver what they're being asked to give. That's correct. Right? And design would be on the name of delivery. Right. And architecture would be on the, on the name of, um, uh, of not delivering. And it seems to me we've got several options here. One is to say this is just a time thing, that actually we do deliver, but we, it's more slow. In other words, it takes a while for the market to tune in but it's no less a product, no less a commodity. You could argue that. Right? Like um, so-called independent cinema mm -hmm. being actually an enormously successful um, oh. Hollywood bankable product. Yeah. So in other words, the, 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 the we haven't said avant-garde yeah. yet, but an avant-garde yeah. sensibility can be totally, yeah. according to yeah. a different time frame, just as efficient. I, I want to dis detach what I'm yeah. talking about from the avant-garde because I would argue culture is possible today and the avant-garde isn't. So I don't believe the avant-garde is always associated with culture. There are moments where they do move together. But quick footnote, can, in your opinion, has there been, could there be such a thing as an architectural avant-garde? There has been, yeah, and uh, yes. I've never been in it, by the way, uh, because the moment in time that uh, I've, uh, Corbu, Mies, and those people were in an uh, architectural avant-garde at the time, as were other painters, filmmakers, etc. There was a time in the early 20th century that was the, t the conditions uh, were ep es epistemic conditions and were... So avant-garde relative to architecture itself or relative to, to, to society? society? Relative to society. Because it seems to me we have an option here of either saying it's not possible in architectural avant-garde. No, I would argue it or is. Or the opposite. Architecture is only architecture in as much as it is not easily swallowed. No, I, I wouldn't argue that because they're, they're, uh, I, I would say that um, we could point to many architects who were not avant-garde. In fact, I mean, if you look at the history of the Italian Renaissance, most of what we talk about uh, wasn't avant I mean, the avant-gardists were uh, Brunelleschi and Alberti. By the time Bramante comes along, we're in the high renaissance, you know, yeah. high period. Uh, and Palladio as a mannerist is not, mannerists are certainly not avant-garde. If anything, my work would be mannerist or late mannerist in mm -hmm. the Scamozzi sense of the word uh, or Sansovino. Uh, I, 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 I think the great architecture is not the avant-garde, by okay. the way. And I think one of the mistakes we make in teaching these people is that what they should be searching for is the new, which is actually what design is about, that the market 
is about the search for the new, and the confusion is the new and the avant-garde. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we should be really careful about okay. that. Okay, no, but we're. I, I mean, I from as you know, for me, yeah. architectural avant-garde is a contradiction in terms. It's not possible. To the to the extent. Well, I'm saying it's to the extent that it fits 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 a kind of cultural image of architecture. Architecture is precisely is precisely culture's image of what it is that avant-garde's challenge. So okay. architecture for for at a generic cultural level mm -hmm. is the representation of stability and order and memory and so on, though the very things that the avant-garde is dedicated to undermining. So to that extent, at the at the public official level, there cannot be an architectural avant-garde. There can be and avant-garde, but in that moment, there have been moments in, in time. In that moment, it doesn't. It, it will yeah. not register as architecture. In time, it can. Well, I, I, I don't know if we could. Um, I think we were all aware that the the domino diagram of of, of Le Corbusier <laughs> was a radical uh, drawing at it, of its time. Uh, I can can't think of many more. But it was presented as an image, yeah, but let's, let's stay with that one. It was present, presented as an image, not by accident of efficiency, right? Even the presumption of that diagram is that the walls would be right. produced by the rubble of the war, right? right? That's right. So in other words, it's about the how to get the most from the least in Buckminster Fuller terms. And so it was presented as the new ordering system and as an image of control. So it was, it was a you could say, yes, it's a radical drawing. Yes, it, it became a weapon in a wide-ranging transformation of the way architects are producing buildings. But you can't say that that drawing is avant-garde in the sense of the work of avant-garde artists. No, all right. right. But so now, so now who, who, now whose, whose, images, whose images had to represent yeah. the opposite, had to represent. Right. And, and, and so in a way, you could say, the domino drawing is the is the uh, is the birth of order after war, right? And the avant-garde is absolutely the continuation of the trauma, right? I I, I don't know so how the we opposite. got into this. Oh, because it's going to come back. It's going to come back. Wait, because uh, well, we we better come back soon rather than later. Because I I would argue that the history of culture produces at certain moments in time ruptures in the sequence mm. of epistemic order, paradigmatic order, and there are shifts. And those shifts, in retrospect, could be said to be avant-garde in both writing, in, in painting, in music, etc. When Wagner shifts uh, from the, th th in the third act of Siegfried, I'm sorry, because I just got, I'm full of yeah, Wagner, yeah. and produces Tristan, and Tristan opens in London, and they say this isn't music, uh, you know, um, because he's shifted from uh, uh, symmetrical triads, which were the structure of the melodic structure of, of the work, to asymmetrical triads. And the hearing, the cultural hearing at the time, couldn't hear this as music. And so he was panned when it opened, Tristan opened. Uh, in London, and uh, yet you can look back on it and say that was a radical shift uh, uh, mm. in the engagement of music and words and, and performance uh, and instrumentation. Uh, so you could call that avant-garde, even though people thought it was junk at the time. Okay. Right. So uh, it we look back on things as you can't set out to be avant -garde. I don't think any any creative act sets, I mean, Wagner was just tired of what he was doing, decided to shift gears. Late Beethoven, and of course, you know, I've been, last year we talked about lateness, and uh, you know, Adorno talks about uh, Beethoven's Misa Solemnis uh, as a late work because the it was not avant-garde, not understandable in Beethoven's oeuvre, not uh, at, at a moment in time where things were going to shift, yet there was a radical difference in his late work than in his other work. Okay, right? so, but, but. So, 
but let's say d bring us back to the design architecture thing. Okay. Because of course the total work of our, of yeah. Wagner and so on, is in a very particular relationship with total design, mm -hmm. etc. In the mm. in the in the Gropius sense. For what it's worth, this would be my spin on your story. I, I'm inclined to accept your petition for the for this particular description of design. This kind of. Um, okay, but not for architecture. You're not going to accept. No, I'm just, no, I'm just. No, I'm. I'm saying I accept the idea that d that design that design could be seen as the ambition for a sort of smooth relationship relative to program, market, function, mm -hmm. and aesthetics, and and aesthetics as 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 part of that. Um, and implied in that is a kind of technocratic sense of design, which is why, of course, design was also a huge word for Buckminster Fuller right. and, the, and, the other, and the other. I would hate to say technocratic, because that's putting a pejorative on it. For no, no, you, if, if you're in that field, it's all good. Okay. It's all good. If you're going to argue that, let's... Which would make a school of design. Yeah. Uh, that would make <coughs> a school of design a school that says to society, we can design anything. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you want. Mm -hmm. And we can do it. That's what we're talking about. And we can distinguish between a good design and a bad design mm -hmm. because it'll be which one is smoother, more efficient, more programming. In other right. words, it can be per perfected. So tell me if that... If so it's a kind of industrialization okay. of what, of architecture. So right? let me ask you a question. If that, if we accept that as a definition and we accept that there's a difference and we're going to put my more modest disciplinary distinction between architecture and design. Why is it that we don't make those distinctions in s the schools that we teach in? I, I can't see one school that I would say stands for something different than uh, compliancy with the smoothness of design. Well, I think to answer that question, which I'd love to give it a shot, it, it seems well, to me we, we, to we you're a dean. yeah, we, for a while. So we, we, if we, we, not dean for a day. Um, we still have to zoom in <laughs> on, we have to zoom in on the design architecture relationship. And then we've got yeah. the design side right. kind of figured out, um, which the world will be very grateful for. But the, the, the architecture part, not, right? Right. And the way I would, would for what it's worth, say it is the r the reason that archi that 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 thing which draws us to architecture and to which i believe all architects are drawn um, is is has exactly to do with a break in that smoothness that we've been talking about and let's uh, argue it from fundamentals if if people even want to come up with some sort of uber basic description Mm -hmm. of architecture, they, they tend to get back to the question of shelter, mm -hmm. right? And with shelter, they get back to the body and the body and place and all that right. stuff, right? But even that most primitive sense that whatever architecture is, it's something to do with shelter, even if it's not shelter itself, oh, but the placing. and placement and the body and right. so on. But as you know, my position would be uh, architecture does not shelter anything no. Uh, in fact, shelter is an idea, right? And architecture does not shelter the human body. The human body does not exist as such without this idea of shelter. Shelter is part of the is yeah. the beginning of the producing an image of that thing called the body, the body. Right? right? So architects, in that sense, don't design for bodies; they design bodies. And every architect has associated with their work a kind of image mm -hmm. of what uh, a body is. Those that want to kind of uh, 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 more easily tie architecture to this sort of smooth relationship with culture and therefore the cultural demand for order, security, control and so on will endlessly in public identify architecture with the stability and certainty of the human body, of place Wouldn't and so on. Wouldn't you say they would identify as well philosophically with a phenomenological... Totally. Yeah, okay. Totally. Just as long as we can get it on the table. Phenomenology was the way to say that, yeah. right? Phenomenology was the way to say it. And all of that suggested that you could, that modernity, uh, 
of modernity in that, from that point of view is perceived of as a form of assault and even a kind of military assault because in its, in, in its origin on uh, this yeah. precious body yeah, but, but no longer what, yeah okay but huh. so, so modernity is seen of as a form of assault and therefore, the, therefore what the architect does is try to modulate the sensual experience of space mm -hmm. in such a way that produces a <coughs> delay or a, at least a critique if not a critique a delay yeah. a hesitation or a form of insulation in from oh. all of this uh, uh, industrial right, uh, uh, capacity and so on. Right. So uh, from that point of view, uh, I, people who are trying to tie architecture to images of certainty and stability have a kind of hypothetical primordial experience between the body and space mm -hmm. around which everything else is either chaotic or authentic or not authentic, right? But it seems to me that the body is polymorphous, absurd, mm -hmm. unknowable, perforated, mm -hmm. confusing, mm -hmm. uh, and, and multiple. So in fact, the role of, of, of architecture, of the role of, of uh, shelter, even staying at this primitive level. As opposed is to design. As a, yeah, we haven't even got there yet. Yeah. Is actually a disavowal of all of that, that traumatic stuff. But who teaches that? The that, I mean, what you just outlined is the basis of a curriculum for a graduate school of architecture I would subscribe to. Yeah, okay. Uh, who teaches that? So what, what school does that? Come on, and we're gonna why get... why don't they? See, I'm, I would argue... Well, that's that two questions. Yeah, but I would argue, because <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that your answer to the first has to be no one does teach that, by the way, honestly. And number two, uh, the question is why not? Well, I think the answer is everyone does, but you've got you've got here a um, you've got a split in the discipline, and and that's why it, it's not architecture or design no, or architecture plus design, because architecture yeah. itself is fundamentally split by the fact that, from my point of view, as architects we are drawn to what is unknown and unknowable about buildings. Mm -hmm. For us, buildings are weird. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we work with them, love them, spend our lives with them because they fascinate us. They don't fascinate culture. Culture has a pretty clear understanding of what a building is meant to do. No, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not the culture I was talking about. No, no, no. Just but stay with us for a while. Stay yeah, with us okay. for a while. Right? Okay. Right? So Ooh. as a discipline, architects are called on to produce images of certainty and security <laughs> and stability which help stabilize <laughs> mm -hmm. particular flows in the market, et cetera. And if you're willing to just deliver that, then fine, you deliver it, and you become one of these people that have moved into what you call the world of design. But in so doing, what you cannot tell your clients is, ever, you don't know what the hell a building is, and the whole reason you're in this in the first place is that you find right. buildings fundamentally mysterious. So the discipline is divided between a kind of private life of architects who secretly find every building mm -hmm. mysterious and destabilizing, and know perfectly that they're not designing for a body, but are pr producing a kind of protective uh, uh, image of what might be a possible body. Classical architecture, the most obvious example, is but supposedly yeah, based but on. But how come, how come then, uh, this this distinction, this split, first of all, is not an equal split because it's 90-10 as far as I could see. Right. Um, In the professional world. Yeah. Well, because we're training for the pro these are where all these students are pro in professional school. They're they're getting a professional called de degree. Right. It's like a business school, law school, med school, architecture schools are. This isn't a humanist discipline. So they're here uh, supposedly to to be part of the 90-10. Right. But if if the cultural purpose, I mean, this is an incredibly gross stereotype, right? But if the, yeah. if, if the major <laughs> cultural mechanism for architecture, the reason that so much money is sometimes put into it, not often, but sometimes yeah, put sometimes. into it, is for it to, to, to as it were, uh, disavow the unknown and the uncertain Correct. and so on, and produce yeah. images of st stability and certainty that allow the rest of cultural life to be a bit weird. Mm -hmm. Weirdness in buildings is the last thing that we will tolerate. Right, mm -hmm. that the that the the building is right. that which actually defines what weirdness might be. It's the buildings are the non-weird, the sort of touchstones. Right, if that's the case, and on the other hand, 
the craft of the architect is th that this is a sort of a fiction. This, this is a kind of mm -hmm. a, a theatrics, and architects are the experts in that theatrics. Like any other performance artist, you have a choice between you can perform it, you can produce the image of certainty for your client on time, mm -hmm. on budget, All of us or can. you can say, by the way, this is fiction, this is theatre. Yeah. The moment you say that, you lose the job. That's right? absolutely correct. Architects, what do you do? architects who are foolish enough to think that what's most exciting about architecture is it's weird, yeah. like yourself, yeah. uh, lose the job. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So then, at a s so you're an extreme case, let's say. Of no, somebody I'm not. Who I don't think that's. But you don't lose the jobs anymore. No, no. Which either means yeah. you're yeah. no longer interesting. That's right. Um, <laughs> or that you've found a kind of canny way of bringing the uncertainty up and into the surface. So you deliver both, and that's what I mean by divided. You deliver both mm -hmm. the product that's being asked for, but it's got a little weirdness in it. And because there's quite a lot of weirdness in your stuff, you don't get that much work, but you get a lot of work. And your friends that don't deliver any weirdness at all right. get a ton, a ton, right? That's it. And here, here, here's the thing, and everybody knows the difference. They can smell weirdness as opposed to yeah. non-weirdness, by the way. Uh, the most unenlightened people. The, the issue is, how is it possible then, because I would argue, I always think it's quite extraordinary that I have a 500 million euro commission, you know, or a stadium for 400 million dollars. I mean, you know, I think it's quite extraordinary that I must have gotten very canny or else very disabled, one or the other. Uh, but I think what happens, and this is, uh, I don't think it's un unique. I think it takes a long time to develop strategies to be able to do both. I think that. I waited until I was 50 before I really went into practicing other than in houses, et cetera, with real buildings, supposedly. Okay, I mean, larger scale buildings. And um, you, uh, you think about things. I mean, all the architects that I consider uh, in this pantheon all wrote and, and put out their treatises before, whether it's Venturi or Kulhas uh, or Ungers or, you know, the, or uh, whomever. I mean, Palladio is one of the ones that didn't. He wrote at the end, but uh, Alberti, you know. It's but just a quick, a quick question right. about that. If, if the real, f if from, the cult from culture's point of view, yeah. some sort of abstract sense of culture, the real power and value of architecture is that it can kind of manifest stability, security, and order. No, I don't think that is the real but power I of architecture. No, no, but this I think if it's this quite is the reverse. But if there is this yeah. uh, call for the architect to represent these things, the call for architecture comes because architecture is meant to be able to represent that without any words. It just is strong, secure, and stable. So why do you guys do all this writing? If, doesn't architecture just stand there and, uh. and explain itself perfectly? Well, you could argue, uh, Tony Vidler has made this really beautiful argument uh, between Rossi and Sterling for the new, the Sterling show that's coming up. Mm. That Sterling, that Rossi was only able to articulate this uh, dissonance, this critique in his writing, whereas Sterling couldn't <coughs> write, but his buildings were all about articulating that dissonance in buildings. So some architects are able to do what Sterling did, and some are able to do what Rossi did. But if you took away the writing, the whole thing collapses. Agreed? Well, if you took away what Sterling was doing, the whole thing collapses. No, but what I'm saying well. is that those, those <laughs> architects who don't write so much couldn't do their thing without the others that do. You can't, you can't imagine architecture without no, writing. That's correct. Right? You, mm -hmm. oh, no. And of course, you, you're not a good witness to that. You're a writer, so you're the, like the wrong person to talk to. But nevertheless, I agree. if we agree that, that, but the very fact that our discipline depends on writing is already a kind of confession that objects don't simply stand there and do what culture asks them to do. So it's the, it's all, it's mm -hmm. the, very, it's the beginning of conceding that 
we might want the object to do these things, but well it's a desire, right? Which, uh, which is the beginning of saying, we don't really know what objects are. Well, I want to go, let, I, I want to go to a case in point. Okay. Uh, which I discovered just in my first trip to Moscow was Stalin's Seven Sisters, right? Couldn't be uh, examples of a more bureaucratic, uh, totalitarian image making. Uh, there's no theory necessary to see these buildings as what they were mm. in Moscow, right? And there was even going to be an eighth one that never got finished, and there was even going to be the Palace of the Soviets, which mm -hmm. was going to be the granddaddy of all of these, uh, in fact, they were called sisters, is interesting. Um, there's no writing necessary for that, and they're not great architecture, but they certainly do something uh, that architecture does in a city. Well, yeah, and I'm, then not, I think I'm not trying to say that, I'm not, I'm not saying that because, uh, having said that, and they don't depend on writing. Without writing, there is no yeah. there is no architecture. That doesn't mean that objects don't have <laughs> uh, yeah. force. Okay. Right? So uh, it's just saying that also the split. it's just that you can't think of the force of the object without entering into a discourse. There was a lot of discourse around those uh, I think really beautiful uh, towers d designed by a guy who worked on the Empire State Building. So again, the heart, yeah. heart of American capital, yeah, the heart of the communist, uh, depended <laughs> on the same. No, they came out of the same. The same spe the, spectacle. The energy, the energy for that started with the Empire State Building. Right. It was Stalin got the idea for this from the Empire State right. Building. But Slavoj Žižek has a great argument about those very buildings, where he says that's the perfect demonstration. That I mean, you. I was using how to, it as a, how as to represent how to represent. Uh, an egalitarian society. You represent an egalitarian society with a series of representations of hierarchy. Right, right. Right? I mean, this is his argument, which is, of course, uh, relates to what I'm saying in the sense that I think if, if the real issue is that one, there's no writing necessary, but are, are they architecture? And, and I think that's where we might come apart. Because I would argue that in terms of the discipline, that you want to, Reinhold wants us to stop and ask questions. No, we'll just, we'll just get more democratic, we'll go, but. You, we'll, we'll, no, we can, we can stop. But I mean, I think we, this is where you and I might come apart uh, because there's something quite amazing about those buildings, but if you were to study them architecturally in terms of the discipline, they're quite trivial. And so therefore, uh, I would say the World Trade Center, for example, Yamasaki's uh, towers were quite trivial, yet there's something really <laughs> obviously very important about them. Oh, well. Um, what? You just chose, I, I, you chose two terrible examples. Either because, either because I'm in love with those two, you know, which just demonstrates that I don't like the things that you like. No, no. It demonstrates the, that we're Yamasaki's really towers were, uh, were was one? a work a, a work um, <laughs> unmatched. Okay, unmatched. Can I tell you what? In my opinion, I know and and despised by the upper, yeah, I middle, and even and lower I echelons of our yeah. field, which includes you. Yeah. they were I unbelievably. Know, I know that we good. are not sitting at the same table, <laughs> and what we've managed to do in an hour <laughs> is get them all to believe that we're on the same page. And the thing that would be really interesting, and we'll get there in eight, nine, or 10, uh, is what, what is that difference? Because there is a gap. Um, and I'm, I understand that, the, I can't explain it necessarily. I know that you love those <laughs> Yamazaki yeah. buildings. But in both and cases, no, it's, it's and, such and, a and I know that yeah. Rem likes the Pan Am building as yeah. the sine qua non of buildings, and yet neither of those, which I acknowledge as uh, signposts or symbols yeah. or whatever, neither of them represent what I consider to be architecture. Well, you consider both of them as design. Yes. Especially the Gropius one, yes, Pan Am. Yes, the right? Gropius. And so therefore, that's where 
I think Philip was a great whatever, Puva, <laughs> but uh, will history remember his work as architecture? Uh, well, uh, in other words, the and I would point to the AT and T building as one of the real, you know, problematic buildings in his era. I mean, well, he had. I mean, seventy percent of his work was was. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I think it would be really interesting to see how history treats Philip, and I think also I don't see. I don't think that's going to be that interesting because if you if 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 it, if anything we said today made any sense, it's yeah. it's that um, architecture is a question, right? Not an answer. Right, not so, an answer. So so <laughs> so, and this gets a little bit getting back to your question about uh, architecture schools, if. At some level, anyway, architects are supposed to be on the side of of of, a, of clarity and rep and and, and certainty. And even you could argue, as a discipline, architects are called on to explain their work right. in a way that's not true of any other discipline. So there's a meant to be a sort of clarity and explainability at, in architecture. On the one that's side, wait, on the one is. side, and on the other side, the reason any any of us ever got into this game was because of the opposite. The that opposite. That objects seem to be. Endlessly, infinitely, but and you pleasurably. But you using architecture and no, its no, design. You no, no, no. To. If, on the one hand, we're we're meant we are, we're in a public discourse which is about clarity and explanations and so on, but we're also in a private discourse which is about objects that are super fascinating to us right. because they're unclear. Right. That means every architect is constantly thinking about that line between the <coughs> love of what the object the love of not knowing what the object is and being called on to say publicly mm -hmm. what they are. Schools then could, and clearly the we don't know what they are is on the side of what the hell is architecture, which is on the side of research, which is the side of exploration, of mm -hmm. experimentation. So schools like this one are very big on that side, what the hell is the object, where the hell is the object going. In as much as a professional school, you have to talk about this line Right mm -hmm. now, you could say a school of design has gone too far across the line, and they don't—they've left this dilemma behind. They In other words, yeah. uncertainty gets left behind. Schools that position themselves as laboratory schools, of which this is one, and I'm not sure if there's a second, right? In that sense, uh, are, are trying to maximize maximize the time spent on the private side of the discourse versus that public side. Okay. I would argue, I'm, I'm not trying to take anything away from your description of this school. Um, uh, I would argue that I would find it hard to make that distinction between Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, etc. I would really... Students have no problem. The that would be really interesting. This, this that is, would, that, this that's, is, I think, okay. I, I'm a big a fan of those schools. I'm a big fan of those schools. I can give you my list of why I think Princeton, Yale, Harvard, and so on are terrific schools. What's great, actually, about the U.S. in terms of architectural education is these profound differences between those schools. There are profound differences, but I'm not certain that the students, the ones that you sh are certain, oh, yeah, they know. Could, could articulate the difference. Yeah, they know. And if they don't, do we care about them? Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh yeah, damn well we care about them. But I think we should start talking with yeah, you. with them. Uh, but I, I, uh, I'm not as convinced that you are. I, I think that we have not made a very, I, I have not made, and it's a really difficult thing, that's why I'm doing a seminar on it, to articulate what the hell, Peter, do you mean by architecture that's different than the difference that Mark Wigley means between architecture and design. Right. I find that really in the realm of mysticism. Well, I, I think architecture is a re reflection on the status of the object, which can mean in this context, it's a reflection about design. Yeah. Right, so, so, yeah. so the, the, it's a questioning and exploration and a placing in doubt of and a framing and an enduring of that question, right? right? Which means an expression like architectural design, was even the name of a magazine, if I remember yeah. rightly, um, is some sort of contradiction in terms right. or some sort of weird expression. The very magazine in which in right. you more or less published your first article under Kenneth, right? 
which was, wasn't it called like yeah, I, I didn't have Towards an Understanding of Form? form? Yeah. October 1962 mm, or 63. So you leave Columbia as an idiot. Yeah. Um, you can't speak French, so you go to London, <laughs> where they sp speak almost American. <laughs> and, and then you find yourself in Cambridge, yeah. and soon you're making a path straight up towards a PhD. Yeah. And very short, very, very quickly, you're publishing a text on form. form. Right. But in the background is not willing to hang around to deal with a professional environment in which you over the budget by right. double, right? right? So there's a sort of a walking away from the profession and its problems deep, deep and into the university. And I never got back. And a theorizing of this thing called form, right. which is not design. Right. Right? Which is not design. For you. But, no, the, no. but that word form was big word for these, for your enemies, right? Yeah. Bauhaus, et cetera, right. et cetera, right? right. So anyway, we're just passing the time while you make a question. Questions. There should be lots of questions because uh, I have lots of them for you guys. Yeah. Well, let me answer your question. Um, Frank gave a lecture this spring at Yale, because I don't want to talk about Bill Bao necessarily. And he showed 30 of my latest buildings in the last six months, OK? And I turned to my dean and I said, how do you know which one is a good one? Or what I really meant, how do, I, how do you know which one is architecture? or which one is critical, or which one is miscegenated, or whatever. Because we had seen boink, 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 right? And my dean turned back to me and he said, that's not the point. And there is the answer that I would give you. Uh, whether Frank Gehry's work is what we're talking about or not, for the work is not the point. That's not the point of the work. And I hope that is a clear answer. <laughs> and if you need a clear answer, uh, Professor Kenneth Frampton, who is a professor in residence here, would give you a m much clearer answer. I can't say that because the the irreparable rift already exists, been papered over in f uh, for the last 50 years, so uh, um, it, we, it's not going to get any better or worse. It, it exists. But I don't think that necessarily means that Frank's work is, I think Frank's work is fabulous, all right? The question is, is it about architecture? And that's uh, a, a really, some of the buildings are, some aren't. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, my way of answering the same question would be to say that if, if, if architecture is the, is the endless trying to figure out what the hell objects are and can be, right. um, and part of that is participating in, in allowing societies to try to communicate their highest aspirations, because generally architects are on the, uh, optimism side of the fence. Um, it's not that any one object is ever more architectural than another, but at any one time there can be arguments about one object being or not. So ac according to the particular framework that Peter's using, the fact that he can't just differentiate between 30 objects makes it, means that it's not architecture. Um, but if we were talking about Andy Warhol, we might say that's right. the charm of the whole thing, and that that's what exactly makes it critical. What it makes it critical. So there's nothing inherently critical or non-critical, architectural, non-architectural about repetition. I mean, it could be argued that. Right. Um, I didn't say there was, by the way. Right. In other words, but Frank isn't doing repetition to be critical. Right. There, so that's what the difference. So is. in terms of Peter's 
uh, operational definition of architecture, that work's just not going to no. register. Um, historically, that will change. Peter's own view may change. Right? He may turn around and say that that just was the golden moment of Frank, those last, those particular six months of 2010. Try me. <laughs> Next. I think it's a fair question, though, and Frank is, is, a, is on the cusp of that. In other words, uh, the, the real issue uh, among the inner circles, let's say, is, is the work art or is it architecture? And a lot of people who are, let's say, painters and sculptors that both of us know would say, it ain't great art. Okay, and, and that's, uh, in other words, uh, that's the real issue. In other words, Michael Graves also is a person that falls on that line who does a lot of painting, uh, and Richard Meyer does a lot of sculpture, and sculptors and painters, I think, wouldn't think that their production and their tendency toward that kind of production is, in, is what they would consider in their disciplines a great work. But you can surely um, imagine a PhD student in uh, 15 years analyzing Frank's relationship to the market and observing that he, he in a somewhat brilliant way managed to turn large cultural buildings mm -hmm. to give them the same status as uh, uh, teapots or whatever right. uh, in, in a kind of very canny understanding of how of what architecture can represent and what it can he do uh, and see that even as a kind of um, as one of the most interesting um, and worth remembering uh, features of this moment, but just as easily in, in 15 years or whatever, there could be zero discussion about that name. I mean, this, this, this is really... I, wouldn't, I, would, I, would say, no, I would say that that moment, the Bilbao effect is always going to be a cultural phenomenon that, we, that PhD students in 15 years will be analyzing. How I, that don't, I, don't, I don't know you because don't, see right. for for our for uh, we're obviously of the same generation. For our generation, um, Bill Bow is an effect, but I think you could imagine that in twenty years, that's not even considered an effect. It's just that I you can't know. think ahead twenty years. No, but you you yeah. It, you know, you know that, that eight, nine, ten was yesterday, and there's never going to be an, or yeah, no, it was the day before. Ain't going to be another eight, nine, ten in your lifetime. Consider that. Can we have another question? Yeah. Um, yeah, you spoke about the disconnect between uh, what architects are interested in and what architecture tends, tends to represent when built. Um, so then, is building at all? I mean, if you're an architect, a true architect, why would you build at all then? Well, I'll tell you what. Manfredo Tafuri, who I would consider a real uh, critic historian, theoretician, uh, one of the important ones of the last century, said to me, Peter, if you don't build, nobody will be interested in your ideas. Um, and I think ultimately the test of any discourse is the performance of that discourse. Wagner can write operas. If you don't perform them, it doesn't mean anything. You can write music and lit if nobody reads the literature, listens to the music, it doesn't matter. So I would ultimately argue that an architect must, must perform in some way, and part of that performance is building. Um, so then would you say that purity isn't possible, that building inherently uh, involves compromise? That, uh, no, I think building uh, any, anything involves compromise. I mean, Publishing, you know, the fact that uh, you write a, an eight-hour eight opera and it can't be performed because nobody wants to sit through it. Uh, nobody wants to sit through a 15-hour film either. Uh, ultimately, there are restrictions that to make to performance. 
uh, of any performance, whether it's a novel. I mean, you can't have a 5,000 page novel. Nobody wants to carry it around, etc. So I would argue all performance is not pure. Uh, it's not original, uh, and yet it is ultimately original because it's always a one-off thing. So uh, Wagner argued that the only importance of his work was the performing of it, that it had to be performed. Uh, a lot of people would argue that they, the composers and conductors argue that, you, that they hear the music better when it's not performed, that in its more original state. So performance is not original, whether a building or whatever. Uh, performance is something other than, or, and if the issue of originality is, uh, which has come into question, then I, I don't worry about the question of originality. I think it's a, 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 a red herring. So uh, I think you have to perform and you have to build. Yeah, I mean, just a variation. It, it, it I mean, firstly, to say that the, that there's a difference between what uh, what uh, 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 what draws architects towards the object and what the architect is asked to to do. This is such a sort of non-impressive thing to observe. Right. Right. It's like saying there's got to be a difference between what painters are really thinking about when they're painting, and it's and delivering paintings to collectors and so on. It's it's it, it's usually something else. Maybe every now and then there's a so uh, what impresses me is that anybody would be surprised by that observation. And that, and that surprise, that maybe there's a big gap between what architects are thinking about when they produce the work and what it is that they're called on to say the work is in public. For anybody to be surprised by that is one more sign of the special status that's given to architectural representations in our society. That, there's, that, that seems to be a more obscene problem. Architects should be thinking about what they're supposed to be thinking about. But if you listen to your question, a, a, a performance could only be understood as compromised if there's a theory, right? And if we've said there's no architecture without theory, then yes, by definition, one way to answer your question is all buildings are compromised. But compromise is not understood as a negative. No. It's, it's in relationship to a, as, to a theoretical aspiration, it would be read as compromise. But all theory, is equally compromised and can be understood as compromised relative to objects, right? Let, let, me, let me add one other thing. All of you, whether you become designers or architects, and you will become mostly designers, will realize that clients do not come around and present you with theoretical uh, opportunities to build buildings that espouse or en engender theory. 90% uh, of the work that comes out of our office uh, has no theoretical consonance or relevance at all to what we do. The opportunities for theory, for theoretical exploration uh, in practice now in mm -hmm. are, are, are very, very few. Uh, to be given an opportunity, and most of the times they occur in competitions. We're doing a competition right now in Italy, which we're, we're not going to win because we're breaking the rules, but we're breaking the rules in order to express a certain theoretical uh, uh, value, let's say, in, in the competition. Mm -hmm. And the competition is explicitly set up uh, so that there is no theoretical value. Uh, the same was, we did a competition a few years ago. Uh, the same thing happened. We broke the rules, we were ruled out. Uh, I'd rather break the rules in a competition and do something relevant to what I consider to be architecture than just follow the rules. Because if you, most, most co commissions are follow the rules, follow the bouncing ball, et cetera. Uh, not set up, we want a great piece of architecture. Uh, and that's what design is, is set up to produce designers. Uh, but if, if they had a kind of a rule that said, um, an architect's only an architect if they build. Um, you'd have to take a hell of a lot of books out of Avery Library. There'd just be a lot of people that up to this point were thought of as architects as the most influential people you know, and they've got to go according to that rule. So name it makes no sense. It makes no sense name to me say. One, name me one architect 
who's written a book that's, uh, that we think about that hasn't built. We're talking about as architects, not historians, theoreticians, critics. Name me one architectural book that's in the library that comes from somebody that never built. Well, I think the question would have to be asked slightly differently. Okay. It would be, um, um, find an uh, find an uh, an architect who uh, may have done a building, but that building in no way contributed to their status okay. as an architect. For, for for example, you you could take somebody who famously resisted building, like Cedric Price, mm -hmm. and you could say, oh, but he did the Avery. Mm -hmm. But do you really think that the Avery that he did with Lord Snowden is a requirement as a kind of license for him to be to have the influence oh, in our field? Him. No, no, it placed him in a certain way. It's socially, but not, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, Price is, uh, I have, uh, as I do with some of your choices, Fuller, Constant, Price, I have problems with those guys. Right, but I, I mean, you know, I sure. think the Avery is a great thing, yeah, no, no. but I don't think I, I don't think it's it's what allows us what's, what allows him to be influential in our. Well, field. let's ask the question: the Potteries think though is, yeah. a, is a really important project. Uh, does it matter that it wasn't built? See, I would argue, in my mind, it was built. Well, but then we're on the same team again, right? <laughs> I mean. The, the pottery sink belt didn't need to be built to be important. Yeah, and according to the theory that you have to build in order to be an architect, well, Cedric Price is vulnerable, not just because he hardly built, but he theorized vulnerable. the importance of not building, right? I don't think he theorized that. When, I, I when, when that's, that, that well, I can't give Cedric, I give him a lot. He didn't theorize the importance of not building. Yes, he said the single most greatest responsibility of an architect is, is to be ready to say, I'm not going to do it. He would, uh, there was an act of British Parliament to allow him not to be excluded from the architects yeah. for saying that, because that was heretical against the discipline of architecture, okay. right? And he fa his famous example was a couple comes to you for a house, and instead of uh, doing the house for them, you should recommend that they get divorced, because the house is trying to pr produce an image of that which has fallen apart, right? He was uh, threatened with legal action for that, and because and he had friends in Parliament, so in yes. other words, see, he's a very good example of somebody who even made not building the architectural statement. I don't think the exception to the rule necessarily disproves the rule of the question he was asking. I think it's important for m most people who want to be architecture to overcome design and the, the restrictions of design in order to perform. If we had no performance, but by your argument that uh, the non-performance, because design uh, wouldn't permit it, the non-performance of what we're talking about architecture, we wouldn't know what architecture was as opposed to design. No, because you're twisting the argument. The, the, to say that you don't need to make a building to be an architect doesn't mean nobody needs to build. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I thought that's what you were you were hinting. It's at. just to say Tafuri was wrong, and y the fact that you've done buildings hasn't made the cardboard house projects, house 10, et cetera, more powerful in the field. In fact, there's every reason to think that the fact that your client didn't come through on house 10, mm. and Philip Johnson took pity on you, mm. and gave you some cash, mm. so you could do develop a little bit more discourse, yeah. You can argue that not only is House 10 in the book form better than it ever could have been in reality, in reality number one. And number two, the frustration you felt at not being able to build this thing at mm -hmm. the end of that sequence, mm -hmm. right, um, was perhaps much more productive and in ultimately influential in the field in shaping you as an intellectual. Much more than the fact that you may have made some buildings you eventually. You couldn't have told me that at the time. Well, that's because you were traumatized, right? <laughs> so you're, you're like, the, you're like the, the last person in the universe who should be saying, if you don't build, uh, you're not an architect. But of course, no, every... If you don't build, you'll suffer trauma. Every... 
Uh, every yeah. uber theoretical architect <laughs> who nobody ever thought would build, every one of those who finally does build always says, you know what, you've always got to build. I've always said that, by the way, so I don't want to uh, right. go back to this. this yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, y y there was earlier some discomfort about the idea of a uh, architectural avant-garde, um, but Peter Eisenman, your definition or your distinction between architecture and design reminded me somewhat of Clement Greenberg's distinction between avant-garde and kitsch, which was based on medium specificity. Um, and I was thinking if architecture, perhaps architecture's sort of guard against the market or against design is its status as a discipline in the classical sense with its sort of own rules and boundaries or at least a stake in boundaries that design sort of threatens because design is, has this sort of seamless relationship with the market. Um, so I was wondering if maybe this shift in uh, school from architecture schools, schools of architecture to schools of design that you were wondering about might be attributable to something uh, or symptomatic of something as obvious as, for lack of a better word, the neoliberalization of education, uh, of higher education. The, the what? The neoliberalization of education, where universities and education <laughs> are, have m more and more pressure to conform to market demands. Well, that's certainly, I would argue, why Cornell is thinking of changing, and it's precisely what I've written uh, uh, against that uh, notion, is that they are needing to reply to market demands, and they believe that changing to a uh, college of design will be one step toward uh, helping uh, ameliorate that problem. Uh, they think that. I, 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 uh, it's not a difficult question for me, but. I need to ask you a question because you've I've noticed it three times. I've taken notes on it. Uh, why you switch languages uh, in the particular uh, terminology uber theoretical? Uh, why is that a? Uh, I mean, could we ask that question just just before we as a footnote to our discussion? Because. Um because it's not your native language, you don't even pronounce it correctly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so why the hell, what, what is that meant to mean to these people? Uh, well, it, it, <laughs> I'm not sure it's an exciting answer, but no, I, I think. It's <laughs> going to be for me, if you give us an, a real one. Well, you know, from my point of view, every architect's a theorist. The yeah. implication of what we're saying is that the architect is an intellectual, right? That an architect thinks about the meaning of objects and the relationship of objects to society. So what we do is think. So it's and very we, is. Let me get to the yeah. end of it. And we've got a, we've got a um, privileged relationship to the question of thinking because it just happens that architecture is used by society as a kind of uh, image of thought in action, right. right? So not only do we think a lot about architecture, think about the meaning of objects, but actually we're supposed to demonstrate in public how objects can articulate mm -hmm. ideas like aspirations and so on. Right. So we sort of think about thinking. So we're very much theorists. But that, but one doesn't have to build. I mean, that's one explanation of why one doesn't have to build. But also the, the reverse is true, that the, the person who builds and hardly ever talks is no less theoretical for that reason. I.e. Jim Sterling. Right. So by uber theoretical, I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean an architect says, I'm a theorist, I'm a theorist, which they're not more theoretical, they're just branding themselves. Who, who's that, me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody has more, nobody. Did you watch the US Brazil last night? I mean, I'm a man of the street. I mean, you didn't watch US Brazil. Come on, you're not a man of the street. You don't want the man on the street even to have a Michael Graves teapot. <laughs> I mean, no, no, but you you haven't a clue about what a man on the street is. Well, that's I, true. Yeah, I well, mean, that's true. Ask, ask Reinhold. He and I have a you know a community. Were you <laughs> one of the seventy-seven thousand? How is the stadium? You should have called me. I was looking for somebody to go. Anyway, so wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to I answer, the, I I answer want to the question. Also, uber theoretical. No, that's all I'm saying. Uber theoretical means somebody says, "Hey, hey, I'm theoretical," 
which no, no, is I say I'm interested in which soccer. is not a more theoretical act. And by the way, the reverse is true. Somebody who says there's too much theory around, I don't want theory, that's a theory. That's a theory. Right? So the anti theory theory, which is by the way all the rage. Yeah. Um, uh, are they Uber and, and as well? Actually, the anti-theory theory, theory yeah, is generally in the ascent and every now and then has a dip down. Yeah. And the dip down... Anti-theory the is, is so to people me... Speak, speak, people speak of the rise of theory in the 80s. I'm coming yeah. to think now that it was the no. just a dip in anti-theory. No, I think the rise of theory was <laughs> in the 70s. All right. But uh, I, want, I, want, I want to quickly yeah. say, I think, that I think your, your analysis um, is, is good and, yeah. and, and, and accurate, and I think that the... the um, the kind of kitsch avant-garde argument of Greenman. So that, that's mapping on reasonably well to this design. Um, <laughs> and actually, if you, I, it's, it's, it's written that way in the Greenberg mm -hmm. argument. But also your final uh, conclusion, I think, is totally super uh, accurate. Um, um, but I wouldn't necessarily describe the university or any universities as being under pressure to neoliberalize. I mean, universities actually uh, doing what they want to do. In the case of Cornell, this is, they're not being forced to adopt this relationship, they're seeking that relationship. I think the question, and I don't see virtue on either side, by the way, I, don't, I think a university that says that it is in a difficult and compromised relationship to, to its outside, that's not necessarily um, a, a kind of more ethically or, or philosophically uh, more sophisticated position than a university that says w we will refuse to be contaminated uh, by the outside. It seems to me um, an intelligent university, and universities should be intelligent, right, th are thinking about that. So a, a, lot, a lot of what you can find universities doing is actually, uh, I've got to finish this, this is too, too important. Yeah, universities are <coughs> not, uh, are, 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 are and have always been an integral part of that so-called outside world. University is part of that system. It's, it's, it's designed to be that way. Students who choose to come to an Ivy League or non-Ivy League enter through the walls are, there's a theatrics to this. What you're saying is I leave behind the market in order to be isolated from market forces in order to think, but why? So that when I go back into the market, I don't go out as an idiot, right? So basically the mechanism of a university is to create a withdrawal from the market in order to engage more intelligently with the market. So, y so the withdrawal is in the name of the market. It's not actually a kind of withdrawal, which is why somebody who graduates from a school as an idiot <laughs> uh, can have the most important contribution to make to that world to which they no at, at first don't fit, right? So, no, it, so the problem would be, the uh, problem I would have is not with a, with a school that is in a kind of hyper-fluid relationship to the market, commodities, and, and all of that, but if it's kind of absolutely seamless, like if there is zero rippling going on between the moment of reflection and the moment of, of uh, uh, action, that seems to me uh, a total waste of resources because then essentially there wouldn't, there wouldn't be any difference between the inside of the university and, and its outside. So why good students spend all this money to be um, where you were in the first place? Right. Right. So, you, so a school, school has to create and endlessly modify the potential relationships between the architect and the market. And schools have to be laboratories for theories about what possible new relationships are there and students have to be better than the schools that they're in and have to defeat the school and demonstrate that the school is not that interesting, which means schools have to be as interesting as they can in order that it's easier for the students to then defeat the school and create new models, new species of the architect. So my problem would be only with schools that think they know what an architect is because that seems to be the end of the discussion and the end of what is beautiful about the architect is architects don't know what they right. are, don't know where they are, don't know who they are, and that's their strength. Right. I, and I've you got just, exhibit you just gave, you 50 just years, gave, 50 years, and he still doesn't you, know you, you, you who he gave, is. You just gave the, the, the dean's response. I mean, it sounded like, come to Columbia and everything will be all right. Look, <laughs> uh, at Cornell, they are thinking of of cutting the comp lit depart, okay? That is being done because they, as they perceive the world, there ain't no market for people other than other schools of comp lit 
uh, out there where it's the one of the first programs in Complit where uh, Daman went and Derrida went when they came to the United States was Cornell. So it has a tradition there. They're thinking of cutting it, all right? And I would argue that architecture is in the same kind of danger that Complit is in uh, and that uh, what he's suggesting is absolutely correct, that we have to be vigilant because comp lit, even if it has no business on the market, uh, is an important discourse, especially at an Ivy League institution. And what's interesting about Cornell. I'm not sure about that. All right. What's interesting about Cornell and what I've tried to argue with their uh, ag school, et cetera, the people go to Cornell to the ag school because it is Cornell and Ivy League. If you lose what makes Cornell Ivy League, that is comp lit, because they don't have that at Ohio State or Michigan State or other big ag schools, mm. you no longer are, in, in, in a sense, within the Ivy League because you don't have those things that distinguish the Ivy League schools from uh, the big Midwestern state universities. And I think. There is a reason to make that distinction, and that what I've said to the dean of the agriculture school at Cornell is you've got to support keeping Complet here because it's what sustains your program as different from Ohio State and Michigan State. And if you don't realize that, lose Complet and you'll see what happens. Right, but, that, but what you're saying is kind of keep the last leader Complet because overall it contributes to our... Yeah. Right, right? Yeah. And, and so does architecture right. as a lost leader, right. by the way, but in that the marketplace. But, but that argument, keep the lost leader to maintain the overall brand, is a market argument. So in other words... It's, it is. It's not like the market is saying, don't have any use for complet, so let's get rid of it. So evil market is doing that. It's the market argument that will keep it there. Right? That's right. So... Um, it keeps their ag school, when they wanted not to, comp lit. When they wanted to get rid of the architecture school at Cambridge University... <laughs> they did. Were you for it or against it? I was, f no, against it. Totally against you it. You wanted to keep the school? Absolutely, and e wrote for it. And, and, and what contributions <laughs> had the school been making to the field? Zero. In how many decades? Zero, completely. Nothing. So had it ever made any no, contribution? No, it was important that a major, one of the Oxbridge universities have architecture. Right. Period. So this it's man it. is such a rabid union representative of the virtue of architecture that he will defend that one of the premier research universities in the world should maintain a school of architecture, even if that school has never, ever contributed anything to the field of architecture. That's right. But he so much I'm, needs, I'm needs architecture to be yeah. in there, right? So I think there is a counter-argument that says that, of course, there probably are very silly decisions being made at Cornell. Right? I mean, not disagreeing with you, but hypothetically, allowing architecture to come and go in the university spectrum would be intellectually more interesting than imagining that it will always be there. I think there's, there's every reason to think perhaps architecture is like newspapers, That's and very, very, very quickly, what? architecture schools will no longer really have what? an intelligent role to play in the university. What arc no, you see I Why not? All right, wait. What architecture school has ever flourished under an engineering school? There are a lot of architecture schools that are within engineering schools and they make more money being there, they're well funded under them, mm. but they they don't produce uh, the kinds of things that an independent architecture school does. So I would argue mm. there is plenty of history to suggest that when you bureaucracy bureaucratize uh, a discipline. In other words, move it into a place where it doesn't belong, like out of arts and science, out of the humanities, etc. Give an example at Rutgers. Uh, NJIT is a bureaucratization of taking certain disciplines out of Rutgers University, like architecture, and putting them in an engineering context. NJIT has never flourished, right? And architecture has never flourished at Rutgers because... Ah, yeah, but you could shoot architecture or put it in an engineering school, and I would rather be shot. I agree. But... Right, you'd um, rather be shot. I refuse to sign the letter saying we should keep the School of Architecture Cambridge. W why? Yeah. Um, because at least you want, at least at some point, 
No, no, it's symbolic. One, one thing to come. The only thing that ever came out of Cambridge actually came from that other, that Leslie Martin hey, thing that was hey, off to one hey, side. Hey, here I am. All right. <laughs> but if... I mean... Uh, let me say, say it to you the other way. And this is, we're just basically trying to get... You just erased me from the Ubermensch category. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still back at the Columbia category. If, if what's exciting about architects, and I, I like architects, right? Thank you. Right? More or less, is, I is would say. As a species, as a species, we are addicted to the questions about objects, right? Yeah. If that's the case, it's the sort of instability and uncertainty about what in the end is the figure of the architect is kind of crucial to it. It's crucial to the okay. whole thing. Right. That every statement by an architect, every drawing, every class comes up the question, what is architect? We, and we've spent two hours trying to say what we think no, of no. architect. And so we're not done. Right. But if, if we are serious about what we're saying, that the fragility of the concept of architecture, the fragility of it, right. is the deep beauty of it for us, no matter that society wants architecture to be everything except yeah, fragile. fragile. But if the fragility of even <laughs> the most solid object is for us the most precious thing, then we let the team down when we say, no matter what happens in the universe, there should always be a school of architecture. Oh, no, I think... Because then the fragility is gone. We're saying, like, it's not that fragile. It's just architecture is... A, is that exactly proves its fragility when it can't do anything and still needs to be there. Oh, that's good. That's a good trick. <laughs> we got to uh, go. we we, we got to go. Thanks for putting up with us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.